welcome from the Manhattan Beach Community Church, an interfaith and interdenominational church at the crossroads of life. We bring you portions of the Sunday morning service from our beautiful sanctuary at 303 South Peck Avenue in the community of Manhattan Beach. We are glad you are joining us for this special service, and we hope it will be a source of inspiration and direction for you in the days ahead. We also invite you to join us in person this coming Sunday morning or any Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. For more information about the church and its wide-ranging programs, please feel free to contact the church office at 310-372-3587. And now, our Sunday morning service. As we gather for worship this second Sunday of Advent, the words of the angel Gabriel, as recorded in the Gospel of Luke, are recalled. The angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. We celebrate this Advent season by lighting the candles of our Advent wreath, which you see at the front of the sanctuary in front of you. Last Sunday, the first Sunday of Advent, we lighted the candle of the prophecy, which is located on your lower left. This morning, we light the candle of Bethlehem. And next Sunday, we will light the candle of the shepherds. And then on Sunday, December 20th, the candle of the kings. Christmas Eve, we will light the candle of the Christ child. We hope you have a blessed Christmas season. And now let us pray together. O oh Lord, as our thoughts turn toward Christmas, we reflect upon your Son, the baby Jesus of Bethlehem, and the man of Nazareth that he became. We pray that we may learn from his message and his example. Our hopes and our dreams and our prayers are all placed in Jesus. We know that he represents God's hope for us and for all of humanity. We pray that with each new baby that comes into the world, that their life may be filled with the promise of Christmas, the promise of love and joy and the hope for an abundant and peaceful life. Mankind has so much work to do to fulfill God's vision for us. We pray that the message and the example and the teachings of Jesus and that the spirit of Christmas will stay with us each day of our lives. As we celebrate his birth, let us rededicate ourselves to his essential truth peace on earth, goodwill toward all people. This we ask in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together by saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Now we will hear the junior and the carol choir. Princess, and we have Savannah who is 
uh, cuddles the cat. And we have lots of other characters in this play, and uh, I'm sure young children will like it because it's all about the mother goose stories and some other things that go along. <laughs> some of them. We have soldiers, we have all We're going to sing a song. Good morning, and Merry Christmas to all of you. It's the um, Christmas season, and normally this is a uh, busy time of year for all of you, and it's no exception in this church, as you can see from the number of announcements this morning. Uh, first of all, let me welcome you to the Manhattan Beach Community Church, and if you're worshiping with us for the first time, we welcome you warmly, and we want to get to know you better. We hope you'll take time to stop by the newcomer's table, which is located at the entrance to the church. Also fill out a Get Acquainted card, which is located in the pew pocket in front of you. Uh, we would like to uh, know you and welcome you warmly. Um, since the children just sang, one of the things that I want to mention is that uh, the song that they sang, one of the songs, was from Babes in Toyland. And uh, Friday, December 11th, Saturday, December 12th, and Sunday, December 13th, the Children's Choir will be performing um, Babes in Toyland on our community hall stage. And uh, tickets are available from Deb, and you can see her name and her phone number in the um, uh, in insert, which is located in your bulletin this morning. Now looking ahead, uh, next um, Sunday we have Reverend Ray Lambert returning to the pulpit to deliver his morning message, Special Delivery Receipt Requested. So that'll be interesting. We're wrapping up the financial campaign, and uh, it's going very well. But if you have not yet completed your uh, pledge for 2010, we encourage you to do so uh, during this December season. Um, adult discussion continues with uh, Dr. Ron Farmer. He's in the middle of a, um, uh, a special presentation on uh, Joseph and Mary and the Christmas season. So. That's the adult discussion continuing on Sunday mornings at 8.30. This morning is uh, Advent Sunday, and uh, that will be uh, taking place for families immediately uh, at the conclusion of this morning's service. It'll take place in the assembly hall. 
there'll be all sorts of crafts and cookies and decorating and uh, a good deal of Christmas joy and sharing of the season. So you're invited to come to the assembly hall at the conclusion of the service and participate in Advent Sunday. In just a moment, Paula Barksdale will be coming up to make a a uh, brief presentation on the uh, alternative Christmas fair, which is being held today in the patio. And Paula will share her thoughts on that with you. Uh, the activities of mariners and shipmates uh, continue, and we call their activities and their uh, holiday season get-togethers uh, to your attention. Um, also in your uh, bulletin is the announcement on poinsettias. We decorate the front of the sanctuary with poinsettias. It's your opportunity to remember uh, people uh, that you love with a special memory, and it helps to decorate uh, the sanctuary. Once again, John and I and the entire staff of Manhattan Beach Community Church welcome you. We hope that this is a warm and wonderful season for you. And we hope that the music and the spoken word will be helpful for you this morning. Now Paula Barksdale will tell you about the alternative Christmas fair. Welcome. Good morning. Thanks. Um, as Steve said, I'm Paula Barksdale, and I'm here on behalf of the Social Action Board to talk about the alternative Christmas fair. I'm, I'm actually a new member of the Social Action Board, which is a group that some of you might know a little bit about. Um, for those who don't, the Social Action Board is dedicated to encouraging members, church members and visitors, um, to look for opportunities to be of service to others in our community and around the world, really. Um, the Social Action Board goes quietly about its work all year long um, in a variety of very meaningful projects. It's my hope that we can be a little less quiet um, as we go forward and let you know more about what we're doing and hopefully engage more of you um, in some of our efforts. Um, and if I could paraphrase Joe Zaro, Joe Zaro last week, who was paraphrasing Gandhi, we could then be the church that is the change we wish to see in the world. Um, in general, I'm pretty comfortable speaking up here, but this is a potentially challenging assignment, I think, because really, who wants to be asking people for money right now? I mean, many of us are very much feeling the recession still. Uh, many of us are feeling the effects of holiday spending already. Um, I know that personally, no matter what kind of limits I put on my Christmas spending, when that December visa bill comes in January, I'm still shocked. Um, so, and also, even though we know that this really should be a time of giving, most of us are flooded with requests from so many causes um, needing our help. Um, every single day when I open my mail, and I'm sure it's the same for all of you, every cause I've ever given to, causes I've never even heard of, have found me and they're asking me for money. Um, so in addition to the, maybe the, let's say the environmental causes that I give to during the year, they're, they're coming to get me because they want me before the tax season is over. They're hoping I can donate then. Um, the Ed Foundations are asking for pledges. The church is still asking for our pledges. Um, and certainly the groups who really focus their efforts on um, housing and feeding the poor, I mean, they view this as their time to shine. So, like I said, it, it doesn't seem like it would be an easy thing for me to be asking you for money right now, um, but it actually is. I love the Alternative Christmas Fair. Um, this day, in fact, this Sunday, is one of our favorite church Sundays of the whole year. As a family, we love going to the Advent celebration and making crafts, and they're actually good crafts, not just kind of whatever, they're really good crafts. Uh, you don't have to be that crafty to enjoy them. Um, and. Then afterwards, we typically go, you know, either before or afterwards, because they coexist. For those of you who haven't been there, they're happening at the same time. We go to the Alternative Christmas Fair. And as you can see from your white insert here, um, which is not to be confused with the Babes in Toyland insert, if you look at your white insert, there's a really nice list of sort of shopping opportunities to choose from. I also want to tell you to bring this with you. I don't know what you normally do with your stuff, but bring this with you um, as you go shopping, because that's your shopping list. 
Um, there will be some extras there, but it would be real helpful if you could bring it. So since most of you um, can read, I don't need to go through this all in detail with you. But please know that these are organizations that are legitimate. They have been pre-screened by your fellow church members because of the excellent work that they do. Um, the first one is Habitat for Humanity, which, um, and again, I said I wouldn't read through them, but a couple I need to mention. Habitat um, also, when you go down there, we have a sign-up for um, a work day in January. So anyone who's over 16 who's going to want to participate, head down there, and you can get the sign-up process started for that. Um, blankets for Love, Heifer Project Needs. The other one I do want to mention is uh, the 1736 Family Crisis Center. Um, Listen, donations are down everywhere. I mean, everywhere for all causes. Thing, donations are down right now. But unfortunately, we even as a church actually have been falling behind in our monthly commitment that we have made to the, um, to the youth center. The one youth shelter that this organization runs is in Hermosa Beach. And we've actually, as a church, fallen behind in our monthly donations. So that one I'd kind of like to make an extra plug for. Um, and Project Learn, it's the only fundraiser they do all year. So it's important. So the question is, really, when you go down there, how to give. Some people like to walk the fair, and they give a little something to each organization. Other people are motivated by a particular um, cause that means something to them, so they give their money there. In our family, we actually let our kids decide where they would like some money to go. Are, are my kids more motivated by knowing that somebody would receive a blanket or a chicken or a box of nails? And that seems very tangible to them. Um, but finally, plenty of people view it as a real shopping opportunity. And, you know, maybe there's your sister who is really good and still insists on writing handwritten thank you notes. Maybe those cards would be great for her. Um, okay, I get that not everybody will be happy if you say, hey, your Christmas present this year is that I gave somebody a goat. Not everyone is going to go for that, and I, I understand that. Um, but for people like that, I try and look at the items for sale as add-ons. So maybe I can say, you know, here's the DVD that I know you really wanted, and you got it. And by the way, there's a family who has nothing who, in your name now, will have blankets this winter. Um, I would like to end with two thoughts. One is the often quoted Luke 12:48, which reminds us that to whom much is given, much is expected. And finally, I just want to call back to what Aaron said last week about this being a season of joy. And I hope that you will take a moment to walk downstairs to the lower patio, go to the Alternative Christmas Fair, and take a moment to give true joy to someone who's truly in need this season. Thank you.
Needless to say, we want to thank Lee Lassiter for that lovely rendition of Ave Maria, and also Mary Beth Lassiter Pearson, who is a 92-year-old cousin who belies her age and has retained her talent, obviously, rather marvelously, and we greet you and thank you, and thank you, Lee. As Steve Campbell has enlightened you, we have begun the movement around the traditional Advent wreath that has been a part of these services for so many years. Last Sunday, the first Sunday of Advent, we lighted the 
candle of prophecy. And this morning, on the upper left, as you look toward the wreath, you see the candle of Bethlehem. We began our service a little late this morning, and I would like to complete my sermon by telling you a Christmas story, so I hope that you will permit me to do that. It won't be long, but I think you will find it in the spirit of Christmas and interesting. When I was realizing the assignments of the Christmas season, I realized that I would be preaching on the Bethlehem candle. And as I was preparing my message to you on this second Sunday in Advent and focusing on the little town of Bethlehem, for some reason I thought about Dan Brown's contribution to the religious world in the sense of the Da Vinci Code, and also Angels and Demons, and I understand he has another book that has come out that we also can surround if we so desire. Many of you are acquainted with these volumes and also the movies that have been a part of the first two volumes. They are interesting to us for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons is that they blend fiction and nonfiction together in a most interesting way. And there's just enough nonfiction or reality to uh, capture your imagination and your background in life and the way your world has gone through the years that these stories become rather intriguing and are wonderful yarns and have possibilities, and yet they are creations of this rather remarkable individual who has done his research and uh, has decided to support Tom Hanks for the rest of his life. Now, all of us... Well, most of us love a mystery. We read them, we watch them on television, we go to the movies to see them. A lot of life is mystery. And certainly Dan Brown's contributions in his two yarns of the Da Vinci Code and the Angels and Demons uh, move us in that direction. However, the secret of Bethlehem is really not a secret. The secret of Bethlehem is really hidden in plain sight and has been for 2,000 years. When you think about it, the stories from Matthew and Luke which tell us of the birth of Jesus and what happened to him, and what happened to the child of Bethlehem, and then what happened to the uh, man of Nazareth as time went on, all have been played out in plain sight and are recorded in the Gospels and are uh, left there for all of us to see. So for 2,000 years, we have been able to see the child of Bethlehem and the man of Nazareth and the birth stories and the events that took place in the little town of Bethlehem so far, far away, hidden right in plain sight where we could see them just perfectly. And we reenact them each year. And we do so in a number of ways here in our sanctuary and on Christmas Eve especially. Probably the Christmas story, and not probably, but in reality, the child of Bethlehem and the man of Nazareth are God's greatest gifts to us. Not just at Christmas time, but all year round. And as I say, they've been in plain sight for a long, long time. 
For the child of Bethlehem became the man of Nazareth. He became the messenger of God. He brought the message of God. And he is God's greatest gift to us, for better or for worse. We are all familiar with the person of Jesus as he grows older and begins his very brief ministry. All of you could come up here and share some of his teachings. Many of you have encompassed in your life and your lifestyle the example of Jesus, which is there for all of us to see. It is no secret. It is not hidden. His spirit, his example, his teachings, his person, the gospel writers and the translators, and 2,000 years have uncovered it all. It's not a mystery to be solved. It's not something to try to figure out. Peace on earth, goodwill among people is something that has always been in effect. The fact that we have focused on ill will and strife on earth is one of those things that happens when we forget those kinds of words. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, so that God made his effort. He made his attempt to reach out to us, and to offer us a great gift at Christmas time. And if we reflect upon that gift and the teachings, the example and the spirit and the attitude and the person of Jesus, we can become better people for it, and we can embrace what's important in life and let go of a lot of things that are truly unimportant in life. And Lord knows there are a lot of them that we could let go of. No, it's all right there. It's there in the carols. When you sing the carols, listen to the words as you sing them and uh, listen to the beautiful music of the choir and so on. And the music all year round sung in this church tells the story of the child of Bethlehem and the man of Nazareth and God's attempt to get after each one of us to bring forth the best of who we are and we're meant to be. Jesus is to be found in music. He's also to be found in poetry and po prose. There is no other individual alive ever who has had as much said about him, sung about him, written about him, painted about him than Jesus of Nazareth and the child of Bethlehem. This is the spirit of Christmas. This is the attempt that is a part of the year-round activity of most Christian churches, is just to lay bare what is obvious and what has been hidden in plain sight for 2,000 years. And it moves across the cultural life, the social life of each one of us, the life in the world and the uh, machinations of the world in which we live in. Now we have a choice, and it's all a matter of degrees, is it not? We can either choose to embrace the gift that God gives us in the child of Bethlehem and the man of Nazareth, or we can choose to ignore that gift or embrace it sometimes and ignore it at other times. And then there are those who have made a living at distorting the message and the messenger, and the teachings and the example and the spirit of Jesus, and we get to sort that out too. And that is probably the hidden part, is to try to discern truth from fiction, just as Dan Brown did in his particular way of putting together some intriguing stories that have merit at some points in a reality sense and no merit whatsoever at, at, at other points. There's no particular interest in that regard. When we embrace the spirit of Jesus, sometimes it lifts our spirit 
Sometimes it lights our way, and sometimes it gives us hope for the journey ahead. If we follow in the footsteps of Jesus, the man of Nazareth, our life can get better. If we truly embrace what he had to say and what he brings to us for God. This is God's plan for life. Take it or leave it. We can embrace it, ignore it, and we can even distort it at times. And that's a shame. This morning I'd like to focus in a story on one aspect and one facet of the secret that lies behind Jesus and his teachings. And that secret can be found in a lot of places in the hymn that you sang to open the service, O Little Town of Bethlehem. It ends with the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. And so one of the things that we look for And we end the service with that, too, in our benediction response here at Christmas time. The hopes and fears. Hope is very much a part of the teachings of Jesus. The first translator of Jesus was St. Paul. And he put together and blended together faith, hope, and love. These were the three ingredients. This is what I call the second trinity the sense that these three things, if you can embrace them in your life, if you can embrace them in your actions and your words, your deeds, in every way, hope and love and faith, you will be better for it and the people around you will be better for it. The greatest gift that you can give to the people around you and the people in this world the people closest to you and the people farthest away from you is the gift of hope. And sometimes it's a day-to-day hope that needs to be given. Other times it's hope in the long run. And we try here at the church to be givers of hope on a day-to-day basis and to people we know and people we don't know. And that's part of our Christian tradition and part of our Christian heritage. So the hope of a better life is something all of us cherish. We have different understandings of what that means. And certainly in these challenging times that uh, come and go as history comes and goes, uh, hope is a very real thing. We hope a lot of things for ourselves, for those that we live with, those that we work and associate with, those that are in the community of the church and in the communities in which we live and in this community of the world. We have all kinds of hopes for a better world. And it isn't hidden anywhere. It doesn't have to be unraveled. There are no codes involved. There are no unusual maps to be followed or places to be located. It's all right there in the little town of Bethlehem, in the child of Bethlehem and in the man of Nazareth. And it is right there in plain view and has been for 2,000 years. Well, I told you I wanted to tell you a story. And it's a story about hope. It's a, it's a November Christmas story. And I think you'll find the story interesting because all of you, in one way or another, can relate to the story. And it's not long. You may remember, and I've said this at many times, that I grew up in the little town of Bellingham in the northwest corner of Washington. And when I was a little boy and started going to church with my parents who were in the ministry in the little congregational church, we sang, O Little Town of Bellingham, I thought. But it was really O Little Town of Bethlehem. And it took me a few years to make that distinction, and I think I've got it right. And my wife, Katie, who lived next door, probably went through the same sequence of events, and perhaps her relatives did as well, that we all thought Jesus was born in our hometown until we finally got to a certain age. 
And then we realized that uh, there was more to it than that. The story I'd like to tell you is a story that could happen in any town. Not only the little town of Bellingham where the wind blows and the rain falls in the winter and the summers are actually rather exquisite amidst the San Juan Islands and the Puget Sound. But it's a town that uh, grew up uh, probably from the gold rush that went into Alaska and so on and into the Yukon. And people just stopped on their way. They couldn't make it any further. They left Nebraska or New York, and as far as they got was Bellingham. Well, if you got to Bellingham, you had to have your own gold, let me tell you. At any rate, at the turn not of this last century, which happened just a few years ago, but the turn of the last century, 1903. Bellingham was becoming a town, and they built a high school. It was a very beautiful high school, and architecturally, it was one of the oldest high schools ever built in the state of Washington, and it was quite ornate and so forth. It had large colonnades on the front of it. And on the front, it had a sign that I always hated to see. It said, Waste Not Thy Hour. Well, that school has been in Bellingham since 1903. Originally, it was the high school. Then it became a junior high school. And now it's referred to as a middle school. And they built a wonderful new high school that served as a civic gathering place and so on. But hundreds and thousands of students who went through the town of Bellingham, which when I went there was about 30,000, and now it has grown into the 50s and so on, and there is a big surrounding area. But a great many people had an attachment to this school. It was called Whatcom High School, Whatcom Middle School, Whatcom Junior High School. The name Whatcom has to do with the creek, but mainly it has to do with the Indians that inhabited the area. They were the Whatcom Indians. So Whatcom School has been a revered landmark in the city of Bellingham for many years, and most families have had some association. And in early November, there were 580 students attending that old junior high school or intermediate school as it was at that moment. Katie attended it, her mother attended it, I attended it, all her relatives attended it, and so on the story goes. On November 5th of this year, the wind was blowing at a great rate in Bellingham. And the wind was such that it was uh, precarious to do anything. But the school was required by the state of Washington and who knows who else to retrofit this big three-story old school for earthquake safety. And they really couldn't do it while the students were in class, and they never do anything in the summer when no one's there. They do that in California. We understand that process. So they decided that they would work on it at night, and they started working on the school at night to retrofit it for earthquake safety. And one of the activities that they were involved in was welding. And they were very careful. They didn't start the welding until the students had left the school. And they worked at night. And they had inspectors and contractors. Everybody was everywhere making sure the welding was done in such a way that fire was not a problem. And even after the welders had gone, the inspectors stayed to make sure nothing was out of place. Well, on November 5th, the same process was in effect. But at 1.25 in the morning on November 6th, a fire broke out in the roof of this old Gothic middle school that was such a landmark in the city of Bellingham. And with 100 firefighters moving in to see what they could do, 
the school literally went up in flames and was not usable for the students. For somehow, the welding that had been done that day had been done in such a way that something had been camouflaged and a fire started and with the wind blowing, there was no chance to save this old three-story school. And parts of it came down and everything in the school was ruined and by the time that the water and the fire and so on had all ceased to exist, the school was not there anymore either in any way that it was usable. Well, as you can imagine, it made the front page of the Bellingham Astonisher. Actually, it's called the Bellingham Herald, and there were pictures and stories, and, and a great deal of grief came into play, for this was one of the great uh, places that people had associations with through the years, and whole families and generations had gone through this school, and it meant so much to them. It was a venerated place, it was a terrible loss, it was a terrible shock, and the whole community was affected. Well, needless to say, the school district, the teachers, the administrators, the entire community, the business community, the service community, and even the religious community got involved in the activity of seeing what they could do in finding a home for 580 students who did not have a place to go to school. And the city came together. There were many heartwarming stories, but there were two girls who were in the sixth grade who took all their savings of $96 because they were raising money to try to figure out what they were going to do to fix up other schools that they could integrate the young people into. And these two girls raised $94, and they thought, well, we can do better than that. And they, they actually sat in a mall outside of Bellingham there and raised $3,500 from people just walking by. But the whole community joined together, and the business people and the people who were in the contracting business joined together, and the city came together to see what could happen. The parents, the next week, early in the week on Tuesday, ended up in the high school for a meeting, and they were told what was to come to pass. And one week later, one week later, 500 and 80 middle school students and many of their parents, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders, arrived on the high school campus, which is a beautiful big campus and so on. And when they arrived that day, they were greeted in a number of ways. Every student in the high school, 9th, 10th, and 11th grade, were wearing Whatcom Junior High School school colors. They were singing the Whatcom Junior High School fight song. They had a green t-shirt to give to every one of those young people with insignias and uh, their school symbols and the name of their school, the Whatcom Wildcats. And they hugged the students and they applauded them. They stood around them as they arrived at the school. The construction people had done their job and one wing of this big beautiful high school had been cordoned off and a facade, a colonnade, had been constructed that looked like Whatcom High School and underneath it said, waste not thy hour. And it was, uh, it was to be their new school. That was where the eighth graders were going to go. And there was a place for them. There was room in the inn for this eighth grade, and they were taken to their new school facilities by the senior high school students. The younger students, the sixth graders and the seventh graders, were placed on buses and taken to their new schools in other parts of the city. And there they were greeted with singing of their fight song, with students in, in their school colors, with hugs and applause and integrated into their new schools. Quite a story, really.
quite a story indeed. You see, there's always enough room in the inn. And for these young people who had been displaced, the gift of hope had been restored. For they had lost hope as they saw the pictures and went in person to see their school burning. And many of the community... We are pleased that you have joined us for the Sunday morning service from the Manhattan Beach Community Church, an interfaith and interdenominational congregation. We hope that the music and the spoken word have lifted your spirits and have offered guidance and a sense of direction for your life. Have a wonderful week.